Hi, my name is Will, and I've been in the tech industry doing mostly software development for several decades now. Today, I want to talk a little bit about robotics. I've noticed a lot of news around huge investments in companies building AI-powered robotics. Amazon, OpenAI, Microsoft, and a lot of others are putting a huge amount of money into this space. And I, like a lot of other software developers, are trying to sort out what that means for us and our careers and what we're going to be doing in the future. I thought today we'd cover a few questions and just kind of walk through how that might play out. First of all, what are the robots for? When are they actually going to come out? A little bit about how to pivot potentially from traditional software development into robotics. And then I'm going to wrap up talking about how robotics may wind up affecting the economy more generally. That's a lot to cover. Let's just sleep in and get to it. First up, robotics have been around for a long time. The term robot goes back to 1920 with the play RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots. The first act of the play sees humanity creating robots. The second act, the robots take over and kill all the humans. And in the third act, the robots are sad that they've killed off all the humans. It's kind of like Westworld. We've got over 100 years of people worrying about robots, and they're either going to kill us, or they're going to take all of our jobs, or maybe they'll do both. And I think part of why this has popped up more recently is because people are starting to talk about what does it mean to combine AI and LLM and machine learning technology with robotics? It's not that crazy of an idea, right? I can do all these amazing things with something like ChatGPT, which starts to feel a little bit like it's approximating a human brain, a little bit. What happens if you can put that brain into a robot? That basic question is what's driving a lot of the investments. One of the things I think is really interesting is how a lot of them are doing tech demos showing off human form robots. And when asked, the companies seem to say that the human form robots are a function of dealing with compatibility and sort of integration into society concerns. I guess the idea there is that if everything in our life is built for humans, then if we build a robot that can conform to the human shape, then somehow that will make it easier. That said, when I was writing the script for this piece, I kept coming back to this point, which is that I could change the terminology between automation, robot, or Android. And depending on the phrase that I used, I had a very different reaction to it. Like if I say that businesses are going to use automation to reduce costs, I mean, that's what they do all the time. Like who, who cares almost, right? I mean, that's fine. If I say they're going to use robots, okay. And if I say they're going to use androids, that's when I start getting visions of the creepy, terrifying death robots, right? So the psychology around the terminology is a big part of this. And I do think it's really interesting how tone deaf some of the companies are about how they're presenting this stuff in a way that is almost like it's designed to induce anxiety. But let's just go ahead and start by talking a little about the most standard kind of automation that we're all expecting, which is industrial automation. Industrial robots have been around for quite a while. Probably the most famous example of that where it starts to transition into robotics is the car manufacturing business. We've all seen various different pictures of factory style robots where they've got articulated arms or some other component, but they're really focused on getting cars through a delivery pipeline. That kind of industrial automation affects all sorts of things that we buy and use. There's some great YouTube channel about how things are made, and they walk through the production of tons of different kinds of things that we use. And it could be everything from the food we eat to the comb or the razor or whatever, and they talk about how automation plays such a huge role in the construction and delivery of all those things. It makes a lot of sense that if you could apply machine learning, especially some of the vision technology, to the automation, that that could help improve the pipeline and the productivity. One of the things that I think is kind of interesting about how this automation progresses is the incremental nature of it. If you look at, for example, the Volvo plant making cars, it's this mix of human workers and the robotic technology. I tried finding some statistics to try to sort out, if you tease apart these things, how much of car manufacturing costs are due to the labor component, which is the part that you could theoretically get economic advantage of by automating, and how much of it is the cost for the materials, the factory itself, the marketing, the sales, all those things. The best I could find seemed to show about 5 to 10% of the price of the car 
uh, actually maps back to the labor. So if it's a thirty to sixty thousand dollar car, that means it could be anywhere from three to five grand, maybe ten, depending. Which kind of talks to how much, even if you did automate everything how much you would actually be able to save. I think most of us would be quite happy to save five grand on our car, but it doesn't feel as transformative as it might imply. Now, obviously, if you're one of the workers who's affected, that's huge. One of the places where we do see a huge amount of money in the automation is Amazon, and that's partly because they just have so much manual labor, and their struggle is to try to close those gaps between the delivery, the processing, and then the distribution of things. It's kind of like the last mile for Amazon. That's why they talk about things like drone delivery. I could see a scenario where they might deploy robots for some of that. Keep in mind that all of these things depend on the capital costs to build and deploy it. And that's part of the challenge is if I can build a human looking robot, but it costs $10 million to make, that doesn't actually buy you a lot for most of our economics. And that's why these highly specialized robots are important. There's a famous graph that shows how wages have kind of disconnected from productivity increases starting in around the 1970s. And that kind of highlights how labor is a component of the costs as we shift more and more into automation in the factory, especially in an era of outsourcing, it shifts and changes the economic outcomes. We've kind of been in this tension between the cost for human labor and the factory automation stuff for, for a long time now. One other area, maybe it's retail robots. Do we put robots in stores? Well, a lot of the stores, at least around where I am, the physical store location already is stripped down to hardly any staff. You can have pretty good sized stores with just a couple of people in it. If you want to have a human connection as part of your sales process, you start getting to diminishing returns on where robots can come in. Uh, let's think about something like Starbucks. So Starbucks has actually automated a ton in their production process and pipeline. The machines that make the coffees are pretty heavily automated. At some point, if you start stopped having the barista in the Starbucks, what you basically have built is a glorified vending machine. You're kind of getting away from the point of even having one of those. At some point, getting back to why are you even going into the restaurant anyways? If it's just a glorified vending machine where the robots bring out your food, do you have that human connection at all? Another space that you see robots in use today is agriculture. There's actually a lot of videos when I was doing the research for this showing increasing levels of automation and robotics. There, there are certain kinds of crops that are not very amenable to harvesting without human labor today because of the delicacy and being able to recognize whether or not it's ready to pull and stuff like that. Those are examples of things where there are companies that are building robots and automation, and it kind of boils down to just straight economics. At some point, if those robots are cheaper, then they'll use them more broadly. And if they're really expensive prototypes, at some point, then you get into is it worth deploying it or not? One other area to touch on, of course, is military uses of robots and AI and tech. And we can see examples of that in Ukraine right now. Drones are a huge part of that war. And it's this interesting tension because a lot of these drones, they're trying to build small ones that are inexpensive. How fast do they scale? Are big robots or small robots going to be a bigger thing? That's a whole space and we could do a whole video just on that. It kind of speaks to me that evolution, even in the Gulf War, they were talking about smart munitions as a concept. And they've been wanting to remove the human factor from the fighting for a lot of reasons. And that's, like I said, another huge topic we could spend a whole video on. At the other end of the spectrum is occasionally you'll see people who are talking about things like hooking up AIs to strategic nuclear weapons. And I guess if somebody decides to do that, we have our answer to the, the Fermi paradox, I guess. Um, but that's getting pretty far away from the topics I want to talk about today. Okay, so then that pivots to the next sector, which would be the household robot, like a consumer robot. I personally would be deliriously happy if I could get a robot that could take care of the chores and do the laundry and the dishes. And it'd be really cool if it could even do house repairs like plumbing and electrical work and all that kind of stuff. That's why a robot like this one, which was built by some students, really caught my eye. The concept to me is something that I kind of think of as like a super Roomba. It can clean, it can do the laundry and cook, maybe. It kind of highlights how also by talking about like a Roomba, how in a way it can be exciting at first, but I think in practice it actually would be kind of boring. I mean, I go over to a friend's house and if they have a Roomba, like who cares? They've got a vacuum cleaner, like whatever. And I could see where that could be like that. Like you'd say, well, of course I have a little house robot. Yeah, 
cleans up, does the dishes, whatever. And I can see where something like that could be packaged nicely. Like if it's, you know, got a kind of an attractive, friendly case and maybe it's kind of cute and maybe it plays little songs when it does stuff. The trick to me on that one is a couple things. One, what's the price point? I mean, if I can have a little super Roomba that goes around and cleans stuff up, but it costs 50 grand, I mean, there's a market for that, I think. But the other part is, is it has to be kind of perfect. I mean, we see how much challenge there is around self-driving cars and getting that last gap closed to really be able to call the self-driving car and not just fancy cruise control. And I think that for a home robot, it has to be perfect because if it's not, you can have big problems. If it forgets and leaves the water running and floods your house, or maybe it picks up the cat and puts it into the washer dryer. I mean, you only have to put cats in the dishwasher a few times before you're going to get a lot of bad press and you baby don't want that $50,000 robot, right? So it has to be really good. And so that kind of gets to the last more science fiction version of the robots, which is what I think of as the Westworld robot or the Battlestar Galactica robot or whatever. And it's a robot that's essentially indistinguishable from a human. This kind of robot is really popular in science fiction, going back to the RUR that we talked about at the beginning. And bar the reason why it's so popular and why it captures the mind, it's also really easy to do in a film because if I can take a human actor and maybe I put a little prosthetics on them or a little bit of makeup, and now I've got a great story about what does it mean to be human and life and all of that. And it's also a great place to put our hopes and our anxieties about the future and technology personified in something that looks like a human. The thing about that is, is that in the real world, the technology for building this stuff that we have is absolutely still way into the uncanny valley. Now you've got that escalating problem, which is now I've got a robot that is maybe 99% accurate, but it might also, you know, put Fluffy in the toaster. And it looks like a creepy zombie and it costs 50 or a hundred thousand dollars. I guess, I mean, but it's gotta be at least five, 10 years away before you'd get something good minimum and it could be longer. It's really easy to read the news and we see the demos and some of them are real and some of they are and what's actually going on. And this is where as a software engineer, you can kind of start to get into this a little bit. You can go up on GitHub and you can search for robotics and you can find a ton of stuff. You can find communities that are into it. You can get simulators, you can get, OS's, there's already existing LLM and real-time operating system integration stuff out there. And you can pull that stuff down and you can start playing with it. What happens is, is as you start looking through it, you start realizing the scale and scope of what you're getting into. The hardware and the software requirements are non-trivial. A lot of the lower level stuff is going to be things like embedded C. It's not the same kind of tooling and frameworks that you're used to working with. And it's also moving really fast. So a lot of things are gonna you know, break easily. And then you have to buy all the hardware and then to actually get it to do things in the real world, you have to then deploy to it. So anyone who's done any apps for iOS or Android knows what a pain it is that the simulators do some stuff, but then you have to test on real. And the edit compile debug cycle is pretty rough. Now you add into that, you're trying to deal with electronics and that gets pretty complicated, pretty fast. To kind of sanity check it, I did go up on Indeed. I punched in Java with a minimum salary of $90,000 in the US. As of March 2024, you get about 20,000 jobs, which is pretty low compared to what it was even a couple of years ago. And if you remove the salary number, it jumps up to about 23. Now, if I put in robotics and a $90,000 floor, I get 7,800 jobs. If I remove the salary number, it jumps up to about 20, 21,000. But then you start looking at the skill sets for a lot of those jobs that are labeled as robotics and they're end user. They're more like a manufacturing job or a technician, especially in healthcare. So they're not actually software engineering roles or developer roles. They're just kind of users of the robotic systems. Then if we go ahead and we look in detail at the job descriptions for a lot of these robotics things, we start to see a few patterns. C and C++, of course, are very popular. There's a couple other things like almost by definition, a lot of these roles are going to be on site, not remote. So that either could be a feature or a problem, depending on how you think about it and whether or not you're excited about going into the factory and working with the robots all day. In some ways, that could actually be really fun. So it's up to you what, what sounds good. The other one I will throw out is maybe you're not ready to fully get into robotics and you don't want to learn embedded C today. 
I will note that if you haven't, I would check out Rust as a programming language. There's a lot of folks who are using that for, you know, performance optimized things for other things like even REST services. It's also the underlying framework for Tori. And a lot of people have been really raving about REST lately. And I think it's actually a really cool alternative to C. It's possible that to kind of jump ahead to where the puck's going to be. If you started learning Rust today, that might put you in a really good spot. The other one, of course, is a lot of the robotics R&D work right now is obviously AI and machine learning. And I covered that in some of the other videos, you know, investing time and energy in learning machine learning and some of the data pipelining stuff could, could be very useful for that space. The last part that I want to touch on is how the economics and the timelines kind of interact in interesting ways. And by way of example, I want to talk about 3D printers. Many years ago, when people first started talking about 3D printers, there was this idea that we'd all have a printer at home and we could just print whatever we need. It turns out that the economics just don't make sense. Industrial automation and industrial robotics can produce products so much faster and they're much more efficient about how they use resources. So 3D printers now, they can be for entertainment, they can do really small runs of custom things. For example, I go into my dentist and he shows off this CNC machine that he's got so he can print a tooth in his office, which is really cool. The way that the processing works for how the 3D printing works, it just doesn't scale the same way that traditional industrial automation does. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we're gonna see that play out with a lot of this AI and robotic stuff. There are areas where it will be very transformative, but it's unclear to me how much that's going to sort of saturate down into our space. Maybe something like the Super Roomba bot might be announced and shipping in the next year or two. But when I think about how much trouble it is, you know, we see car companies struggling to launch a new car because they want to do EV based cars. We've been building cars for over 100 years. And for some reason, putting the battery pack in and sorting out all the systems is really, really hard. And a AI powered LLM robot with vision and all those things that can be manufactured and deployed at scale for a price point that folks would be want. It feels like it's kind of probably a little ways out. In the near term, I actually do think that the AI stuff will be deployed more quickly onto our phones or our computers, which is why we're seeing like the new version of the Mac and iOS and Windows all building in local LLM tech. Just like when Siri came out. I mean, Siri inspired the movie Her because when it came out, people thought it was just going to blow everybody's mind. And then in practice, it turns out to be, eh, I mean, it's cool. You know, mostly I use it to set timers. That's why I use Siri for, that's the number one thing I use Siri for, is set timers when I want to make my eggs or boil, boil some hard boiled eggs. There's this checklist that everybody should apply for technology and tech hype. Probably the biggest warning flag for me on something is when I see a tech demo in a highly controlled environment with ordinary people not being able to play with it. For example, the TidyBot, which is really cool, but that's running inside of this test lab, right? And so when I see a lot of these companies and they're doing you know, blurry videos or, or what have you, it starts to make me go, hmm, I don't know if, how far it is along. And that difference between I have a cool thing that works as a, as a demo and scaling it up to a product for enterprise or for, or for consumer, it's just a whole different level and magnitude. Now, the weird part is, I really actually would like these robots to work and to actually come out because we have a lot of big problems. We've got housing crisis here in the US, we've got healthcare challenges, we've got climate change, we've got infrastructure issues, we've got demographic challenges. Um, so we know we have all these challenges and I'd love to have a lot of this stuff get cheaper and ideally a lot cheaper. Like I'd love to fix our grid and improve our efficiencies and that's gonna involve huge amounts of work. I'd like the technology to be able to solve some of these problems. So if we can improve even just the industrial automation, that'd be really cool. The problem is, is that it's kind of linked, right? The automation side comes with a real world cost structure, and that's the part that's hard, right? So even with cars and manufacturing, we saw how, you know, auto companies would combine either using automation and or outsourcing their factories as a way to get wages down. In economics, there's a term which is the resource curse. And the idea with the resource curse is that you have a natural resource and then people come in and they do a deal to get the resource out, but the people who live in that country wind up suffering greatly. This is where we see a lot of dictatorships coming up. It's from that sort of economic system. And I think the worry that we all have 
is that AI and robotics and automation are going to lead us to the same kind of model that we see with the resource curse, but for everybody. And what that looks like is something like Dune or Blade Runner, and that's our future because we can't get these pieces together. And that's the conundrum. You can't solve the big problems without more automation, but if the automation also leads to widespread job loss, then we're looking at a dystopia. And I think that acknowledging that if a lot of people lose their jobs, that hurts, and the United States hitting 20% unemployment in the Great Depression is how you wind up with a lot of social problems and the rise of fascism and communism. It's just this really weird challenge where you've got all this dislocation and mix. I think anybody who's a software developer today and is worried about the impact of AI and LMs and low-code, no-code tools on their career is getting a taste of that sort of anxiety about how does the economics work. Let's say that robotics is the new thing. If everybody has to go back to school and we're going to spend two to four years maybe going to college and retraining in electronics and robotics, how is that supposed to work exactly? And who's going to pay for it? And what does that look like? And the U.S. in particular has had a pretty long record of just saying, hmm, figure it out. So, of course, there's a lot of anxiety. And I think that's important to acknowledge. When you start asking folks about some of the economic aspects of this automation, the thing that comes up really frequently is universal basic income. And it's the idea that then by doing direct payments to everyone, we can ameliorate some of the nastier effects of this transition. UBI is a really interesting concept and we're gonna talk about it in the next video. I hope you've enjoyed this one. Like and subscribe and all that fun stuff. Uh, I do wanna note that in the last couple of videos I've done, folks have been putting stuff in the comment section and it's been really fun. You know, YouTube has a reputation for having a terrible comments section and I've been really impressed. People have been chiming in with good comments. There's a lot of people who are expressing their concerns and fears and people are supporting each other and talking with each other about it. I just wanna say thank you to everybody who's commented and done it in a constructive way that's helpful for folks. Um, just really impressed and thank you so much. So like I said, go ahead and hit like and subscribe and ring the bell and all that fun stuff. And I uh, hope to see you uh, next time soon. Thank you so much for your time.